Good evening, and first of all, a very happy New Year. Well, um, have you had a new telescope for Christmas, or are you going to get one? If so, um, I'd like to give you a few tips on how to set it up and how to use it. So, for the moment, out to the garden. <laughs> well, Happy New Year to you, and let's hope we get some better clear weather this year. It certainly couldn't be any worse than it was last year. <laughs> This programme's about your first telescopes. Perhaps you've had a new one for Christmas. Well, getting your first telescope can be really, really exciting, and it can literally open up a whole new world of astronomy for you. It can also be rather daunting, so we're going to present some simple tips on how to get set up and how to get started. And crucially, we'll try and pick out a few objects that you can look at for the first time. Over the years on the sky at night, Patrick always tried to steer us on which telescopes we should get and what to use them for. Well, as you can see, we are doing this programme from my home in Selsey, where I've got an old thatched house within sound of the sea. And in the garden, I've set up my two telescopes, the big ones, uh, a reflector inside a runoff shed and another one inside a dome. And it's from here that I carry out my own observational work. His telescopes were for the advanced astronomer, but he also had lots of advice for the beginner. I'd like to begin by showing you my own first telescope. Here it is. It's a three-inch refractor, and I had it when I was a boy of 11, and that goes back to 1934. It wasn't new then. I think it must have been built around about 1910. And I call it a three-inch refractor because it collects its light with a lens or object glass three inches across. I'm very refractor-minded. They give lovely, crisp images. And, of course, I am essentially an observer of the moon and planets, so I like refractors. But if you're interested more in star clusters, nebulae, and what we call deep sky work, I think probably the reflector is the better. That advice is still good today. We have invited along some newcomers to astronomy who have all acquired a new telescope in the past year, but are finding them a challenge. I'd really like to learn my way around the sky a bit better. Um, I've, been, I've had my telescope now for the best part of a year, but weather and living in London means I don't get to get it out very often. I'd like to learn how to use the scope. I've bought it because I've always been a little bit interested. But how do I use it? I don't know. Yet. I would really like to get to grips with using it properly and understand it a bit better. Stephen and Peter Bosley are both retired and bought their telescope earlier this year. Unfortunately, it's still so new, it's in the box it arrived in. I want to get the beast out of the box. I want to get it set up on its tripod. I want to point it at the sky and I want to be able to know I'm looking at the right things and just plain enjoy it. New technology means that there's a whole range of telescopes on the market. So let's see what everyone has brought. It's going to be a surprise for all of us. What we got for us? Okay, so this looks like a tripod. Mm -hmm. uh, it does come out. <laughs> it went in. There we go. Some of the telescopes here cost around £300, while others are nearer 1000 That's the scope itself. OK. The one thing I've noticed, we've done something uh, slightly wrong to start with. We've got the eyepiece pointing it's down, so let's, down. Just, let's just spin it around. Uh, so we do that with it. Oh, there's the lens cap falling off. These telescopes all have a computerised go-to mount. When set up correctly, the telescope should take you to any object you want to see in the night sky. There we go. First, we have to assemble the telescopes. For the first few times, it can be fiddly. But there is a lot you can do in the daylight, which makes things much easier. So, you know, once you've done it a couple of times, do you find that you sort of know the routine? Once I've done it a couple of times, I find I'd like to keep it together. Yeah, yeah. That's why I got mine set up, because what actually happens is you get half an hour to set up, and then the clouds come in. Yeah. So this is the, the bit that attaches to the telescope, and this has all the motors in it. So you place that on there. Right, now the uh, most important bit, the tube itself. I think the thing which is um, quite misleading with a, a, a scope like this is that it looks like a small telescope, but in fact it isn't really that small. No, Because exactly. it is equivalent to a telescope much longer. Yeah. And that means that the, the focal length of it, that's that number which is on the side here, see that it's number there, F 1, equals 1,500. That means it's got a focal length of one, me one and a half metres. Yeah. So it's actually equivalent to a one and a half metre long telescope. And that'll make things difficult for you to find, yeah, <laughs> find <fantastic>. things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is probably why I've been That's having so many problems. Some... This is what we call a finder scope. It's basically a little telescope. And all it does is slide onto here. So you can now use that to line up the telescope on the, on the lamp down on the lamp. there. 
Ah, oh, there it is. You got it? Yeah. OK. Well, right. we're, we're roughly lined up there. So if we look through the telescope, what can we see? I, do you know what I can see? I can see a tree. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> not so lined that, up. That shows that it's not lined up at all. So if we go up and then across. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you look through there, it's not quite in focus, but you can see the lamp. Yeah, that's it. OK. So now if you look through the finder again, mm, is that way again. off? Yes. So if you adjust the finder so the lamp comes into view and it's in the crosshairs... Mm. Can't guess it. Oh, there we go. So yep. you now know that that is lined up with that, so that when the sky goes dark tonight, if you get something in there, mm -hmm. then theoretically it should be lined up with that yes. as well. So we can give that a try later on tonight. Well then, guys, we've got a, a few other guest telescopes here, and it's a nice array, actually. An impressive wow. array, yes. Yeah. This is yours, is this? This is actually my first telescope. This is my second telescope. You've so upgraded there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife saw this in a charity shop for £20. Right. right. Uh, so I'm not sure how it got there. My, my guess is that someone got it for Christmas or a birthday, and in the end didn't know what to do with it. Well, well, I don't have my first telescope here, but we have bought Patrick's out, and Patrick's is a lovely brass refractor. It's actually one of the simplest forms of telescopes you can get. It's got a primary lens at the top and an eyepiece at the bottom, and the light is magnified in a very simple way. Uh, I mean, it's on a good it's tripod bad, as well. Yeah. But now, Pete, we come to this. <laughs> You, Why don't you tell everybody what this is? I saw that and I thought that he'd been catching lobsters because it doesn't look like <laughs> it catches photons to me. You were just so rude about stuff. My, my first ever telescope was actually a 40 millimeter refractor, so that's quite a small refracting telescope. But I really wanted to go bigger and I couldn't afford it. So at the end of the day, I decided to make my own. Right. And this is all that's left of it. I think the first deep sky object I ever saw through that telescope was the Ring Nebula. Well, hopefully we'll be able to show our newcomers some interesting stuff later on. It, it does look like it's going to clear, I doesn't think it? it? Will, do you, yeah. What do you think? Should we take? Uh, go on, do that optimistic thing you do when we're camping. It's awful when you say it's going to clear. I think it's going to be fine. There yeah. you go. You're oh, soon. might as well go in now. Then. Right, yes, good. <laughs> well, let's hope for clear skies later. There's a real feeling of anticipation and excitement as darkness approaches. Over the years, Patrick has hosted some great star parties here, and we've been lucky with the weather. The transit of Venus in 2004 was an amazing event, with astronomers flocking to Farthings to share this unique experience with Patrick. And we're about to see something that no one now living has ever seen. So let's hope the skies stay clear. But Patrick has not always been lucky with the weather. His live show for the 50th programme of the Sky at Night put him off observing on live TV for some time. I can't see one single star, can you, George, anywhere? Any luck? No, I must be able to see it before I can get on to it. <laughs> Trouble, of course. Yes, there is the moon. I can see it for the moment. No, it's gone again. It's gone. Yes, and there is Saturn for the first time on direct television. Is it gone? Oh, no. Just as I got it on the crosswires, it blacked right out. How absolutely typical. There's nothing we can do about it. I can't move a 24-inch telescope quicker than that. No, I'm afraid you can't. Let's hope we're a bit luckier with the weather tonight. Back in Patrick's garden, we are waiting to show everyone how to use their telescopes, but the skies have been teasing us with clouds. Finally, it clears, and Paul has got all excited. The sky's really delivering for us now, and on Jupiter, there's something rather special tonight. Uh, can you make out the great red spot? Yes, <laughs> I can. It's amazing. It's absolutely the best view I've ever had. And to it's think incredible. that that spot is sort of three three times yeah. the size of the Earth, you can see just how large Jupiter is compared to the Earth. Once you've been looking yeah. at Jupiter for a while, the colours are quite spectacour. Are you finding mm. any colour there? Yes, definitely. And, you know, with my telescope, which is smaller, I don't see colour. Yeah. And so this is wonderful. I've never seen this much detail. The advantage of a computerised go-to mount is that you can find faint objects in the sky, quickly yeah, and easily. Problem. We have to make sure the telescope is aligned with the sky. To do that, we pick out some bright stars and check the telescope is looking at them. I've come to give Derek a hand, and we've chosen Deneb in the constellation of Cygnus as our first bright star. Uh, so, OK, we're nearly pointing up at Deneb, so yeah, if you point up towards Deneb up there in Cygnus, you can see a very bright star. And is it right in the centre? It is. It says brightest star or two star align, so we'll do two star align. And then we choose a second star. We want something as far away from Deneb as you can. Which is... Now, ideally, there's Aldebaran up near Jupiter. So I reckon we spin all the way around, 
and try and find that. So it's going to, oh, looks like it's going to try and guess where Old Everon is. So because we've given it one star and it knows where it is and what time it is, it can get a good guess of where it is. What it does is it, it slews over really quickly. Mm -hmm. The beep says it's fine. Yeah. Okay. How's that look? Does that look a bright star to you? Yes. Yeah. It does. So then when we've got it, hit enter. Alignment successful. Hey, it right. works. It works. Now we test it. Should we try and see if it'll find us the Andromeda Galaxy? Yes, please. And in theory, it's now going this in the is, right direction. Is, it's going in the right direction. <laughs> so let's hope this goes to the right place. Here's the test. Let's see. Is there anything in there? Oh yeah, it's in the viewfinder. Uh, we look through the main scope. Is there anything in there? Because it might just be our finder's not quite aligned. Is there a fuzzy patch? It's right yeah. stuck in the middle. Is it? Near enough, yep. Oh, very excellent. fuzzy. Look at that. That is a very good shot, look. Yep, that's definitely the Andromeda Galaxies. There you go. The sky, as they say now, Derek, is your oyster. So <laughs> I will hand over the paddle to you, and you can pick anything you want in the sky. And in theory, your telescope will uh, find it. Will find it. So, Absolutely, um, it's great stuff. Um, Danny wants to learn how to find objects um, by star hopping. So we are switching off the sky sat nav and I'm helping her to find M35, the lovely star cluster in the constellation of Gemini the Twins. Oh, there we go, yeah. You've got the, the think, two stars. I think I do. Do you want to ah, check? Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's there. Yeah, you definitely got them. Yeah. So now you need the scope to go up and slightly up round the slope, slope. to the right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what am I looking for? In it's the a little scope? cluster. It looked like a little, little hazy patch. Oh goodness, yeah. <laughs> okay, now I know what I was looking for. That's fantastic. Yeah. Lots and lots Slightly. of stars. Yes, lots and lots of stars. Yeah. But well, it's tricky to find. But I got there. And it gets easier every time yeah. you do it. Um, you you learn the, that pattern of stars. Yes. And you'll th you'll remember how tricky yeah. it was. Yes. <laughs> and then you'll do it again, <laughs> and it will get a lot better. easier. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. That's a pleasure. January, it's the last month of our Moor Winter Marathon and you can still take part. For details, see our website bbc.co.uk forward slash sky at night. Right Julia, so we've got a very simple telescope here. Do you like how simple it is? It's very simple, it might be simple enough for me. It's got no go-to mounts, it's not even got a viewfinder because Chris left it at home. And I've set it up to look at the Pleiades star cluster. Are you familiar with Pleiades? Well, um, I call it the little shopping trolley. <laughs> the li that's brilliant, the little shopping trolley it is. It is quite impressive, even a telescope that size. Oh yeah, it's very pretty, like little jewels. Yeah, little jewels, yeah. yeah. Your shopping trolley full of little yeah. jewels. <laughs> so a telescope this size is sort of a, a good beginner's one, I think. It's easy to handle. Yes, and also you can pick the whole thing up, move it, and actually quite quickly get into position and do something else. You haven't got to fiddle about with too much setup, have you? No, no, that's right. It is very accessible, isn't it? You're mm. sort of up and ready to go. It's been great actually tonight seeing people get started and the best thing was seeing people make mistakes because it is hard when you make a start it into, yeah. and then getting them sorted out, persevering. We all made mistakes when we started out. We're, you know, we're fairly, I'm still doing it now. We're fairly, we're fairly <laughs> confident now but we did make a lot of mistakes but it was also interesting to see how excited they were when they were overcoming those mistakes yeah. and solving them. Well we've been looking at a few planets in our solar system. Uh, over the past year, there's been a lot of stories about planets in other solar systems, some very exciting news, and uh, Chris Lintot's been finding out more. The astonishing discovery late last year of a rocky, Earth-sized planet rocked astronomy. It's orbiting a star called Alpha Centauri b in our nearest star system. And at just four light years away, it's almost imaginable that man could one day journey there. Science fiction may just be transforming into science fact. The planet, rather unfortunately dubbed Alpha Centauri BB, sits in a three-star system comprising a faint red star and two brighter stars all dancing a gravitational tango. The planet is right in the middle of that dance, orbiting one of the brighter stars. Lewis Dartnell is an astrobiologist and speculates about life in other worlds. He joined me to talk about the planet and about the system that it lives in. Now this planet is on a very, very tight orbit around its host star. It orbits what's um, 
quite similar to the Sun. It's, it's, it's roughly Sun-like um, Alpha Centauri b. And it orbits about 10 times closer to its star than, than even Mercury does. So, so it must be very hot. So it's exceedingly hot. It's well over 1,000 degrees on its surface. So it wouldn't really be a rocky world in that sense. It'd be kind of a magma or kind of lava ocean world. So no hope for life on this world. But what is very promising and exciting about this is that from the Kepler Space Telescope, we now know that terrestrial rocky planets tend to form as, as part of, of families of clusters. In the same way you'd have you know, several puppies in a litter, we'll have several puppies, several planets in the litter around its star. And so, so where, where we find one, one rocky planet. We'd expect to find others. And so the race is now on to look for planets that are a lot more like the Earth, that are orbiting further away, aren't scorchingly, rock-meltingly hot, but are in what's known as the habitable zone. Stuff. The Goldilocks the zone. The Goldilocks zone, exactly. So not too hot, not too cold, but just right, just right for liquid water. This is the interesting point, isn't it? Every time we find one of these weird worlds, one of these strange systems, then it tells us something about how planets form. And that's what we're trying to understand sure. here, and understand how unusual our solar system is. It is almost also that uh, every time we try to make some kind of general sweeping statement about this is how planetary systems are, zing, we find a, a counterexample, almost as if on cue, yep. to, to kind of get everyone thinking again about how these things really work. Yeah, and the list goes on. We have seven planets around double stars, so not orbiting individual stars, but orbiting both stars like this. We've got one planet around four stars, uh, just to make things more complicated. But let's come back to Alpha Centauri BB. There's a planetary system four light years away. We've got to go there, surely. Yeah, so it's, it, it's on our doorstep. It, it's invitingly close, tantalisingly close. What would we get from such a mission? Presumably we'd fly through the system. Stopping is going to be hard when you get there. What would you see of these systems? But it'll be a close-up view of, of another, another world, another solar system, which you can then compare. You, know, you can start doing comparative solar system studies between Alpha Centauri B, B, or any other planets we discover there, and Earth and Venus or Mercury and other planets we have here. So it's, it's just another way of, of finding out as much as we can about ourselves by comparing and contrasting it against other examples. And this is the best shot, so let's hope we head off there soon. Lewis, thank you very much. Thank you. When Patrick presented the first Sky at Night in 1957, space travel of any sort was science fiction. So who knows? In the next 55 years, a voyage to Alpha Centauri might just come about. If you look up into the sky on any dark night, you will see thousands of stars, and all these stars are suns in their own right. Many of them may have other planets going round them, other Earths if you like. I'm sure they have, and I'm also sure that many of these other Earths are inhabited, some by people who know as much as we do, and others by races who know a great deal more. If we are ever going to contact those other civilizations which must exist, it's got to be done, I think, by some method about which we know absolutely nothing at the present moment. And I suspect we are just about as far away from that kind of thing as King Canute was from television. But some things never change. For more than half a century, Patrick encouraged us simply to look up at the night skies and to wonder. That pleasure is still there for all to enjoy as we, like Patrick, reach for the stars. Next month, we'll be talking about the sun and the lovely things the northern and the southern lights. Until then, good night. Venus, goodbye. Goodbye, Venus, and thank you. Well, that was absolutely great. And so, from Scotland, at the end of our annual eclipse for the moment, good night. I think it's not too early, I hope, to wish you a very happy Christmas, New Year, and clear skies. Good night. Well, we told you it was like science fiction. Good night. And for now, good night. Is Mars a dead world, or is it a world where there are things which live and grow? Good night. And so, from Brighton, where the sky, sky is now completely overcast, good night. Good night. Good night. If you have got any kind of telescope, well, have a look at the Pleiades, and you'll be astonished at the richness of it. And even a small telescope will give you a superb view of this magnificent cluster of suns. Good night. <laughs>